Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for participating in the poll about uh, what is your fa favorite Filipino uh, monster. Um, I just want to thank everybody for their patience as we had some, some tech issues. And uh, thank you for joining us for um, Philippine Fright Night, um, which is an event hosted by the San Diego Public Library in honor of um, Filipino American History Month. Uh, my name is Azalea, and I'm the branch manager at the Skyline Hills Branch Library. Um, I'm excited to introduce our local writers, um, Mari V. Sullivan and Thelma Verada de Castro. Um, Mari V. is the award-winning author of the novel The Mango Bride, which is currently in film production. Um, Mari V. also authored two horror books, um, an adult fiction book called Spooky Mo, and a children's book called Philippine Fright, um, which are both the focus of this evening's event. Um, Thelma Verada de Castro is a dramatist and creative artist, as well as the founder of San Diego Playwrights. And um, both of them have some um, exciting announcements to make about the, some of the things that they've been working on, so I don't want to spoil that. Um, and uh, without further ado, uh, we'll be starting the program with um, two brief readings of uh, Philippine Fright and Spooky Mo. And then um, we'll do some brief Q&A and hopefully you'll get a chance to ask any questions that you might want to ask them. And then we'll, we'll lead on to um, our uh, guest uh, ghost storytellers, um, Jojo, Albert, and myself, and, and um, if there's any time left, uh, we'll, we'll have some more discussion. Oh, and uh, reading right now will be um, Thelma Rada de Castro, and she's going to be reading um, Philippine Fright, which uh, I just really love this book. And it um, it wasn't just for kids, but it's um, 13 original short stories that Mari V wrote. And um, some of them are funny, some of them are a little scary, and um, some of them are very theatrical. And so she'll be reading um, a story about a toeless man. Are we ready? Yay! Here we go. The Tale of the Toeless Man. In a barrio outside Calibo in Aklan province, there once lived an old man who loved to make puns. Most people groaned upon hearing his jokes, but that amused him to no end. The only one who actually laughed at Lolo de Noy's jokes was Benjo. The boy's parents had died when Benjo was a baby, and the old man had taken him into his home. Now, in that same town lived an ill-tempered old woman who was rumored to be a witch. She was always scowling and rarely spoke to her neighbors. Lolo de Noy passed her on the road one day and greeted her with his usual cheer. Good morning, Nai Isang, Ising, he called. Was the vinegar for your dried fish very sour this morning? Why do you ask, she snapped. Because it shows on your face, he chuckled. How dare you, she cried. Have I offended you? I'm so soury. Nai Ising turned red. You will pay for this. No one makes fun of me and gets away with it. And off she stomped. Lolo Denoy paid no mind to her curse. He just could not resist a good pun. He told many more that day and soon forgot about Nai Ising. That night, Benjo awoke to his Lolo de Noy's moans. Oh, whoa, where are my toes? He wailed. Benjo looked under the blanket and gasped. The old man had indeed lost all his toes. This isn't punny anymore. Where did my toes go? Wait here while I call the Arbilario. The frightened boy ran across town to fetch the medicine man. He banged on the door until the Arbilario emerged. Do you know it's past midnight, he grumbled. 
Gio Santo, please hurry. Lolo Denoy has lost all his toys. Toes, Benjo cried. Don't panic, Gio Santo yawned. Without his toes, I don't think he'll be going anywhere soon. Taking his herb basket with him, the arbolario walked back to the old man's hut. Tio Santo shook his head at the sight of Lolo Denoy's feet. Looks like the work of a very powerful witch. A lesser Aswan would simply have taken both feet. This one really wanted you to suffer. Oh, whoa! Now I can't even put my foot in my mouth, groaned Lolo Denoy. Stop joking, or I won't put your toes back on your feet either, Tio Santo teased, trying to console his friend. Benjo, look under this hut and bring back the first animal you find. Benjo ran outside and ducked under the house. He returned with a dirty black cat. It hissed and spat, but the boy held it tightly by the scruff of its neck. Aha, Tio Santo exclaimed. Cats are Nai Yi Sing's favorite animals. I suspect she's turned into a cat to cast this spell. Let's see what's in her mouth. He forced open the cat's jaws. There's a big left toe down there, he yelled. He reached in, but try as he might. He could not pull the toe out of the cat's throat. He sat back and thought for a minute. What are you waiting for, Lolo Denoy demanded. Are you planning to tip toes through those two lips by staring at that cat? As soon as he spoke, the cat began to choke. Suddenly, it coughed up his big left toe. That's it. My magic won't work. She's too powerful for that, Tio Santo cried. But if you disgust her with your jokes, she might spit up all your toes. How can I crack jokes when I can't even crack my toe knuckles, the old man griped. Again, the cat gagged, throwing up his big right toe. Tio Santo caught each digit, setting it on the proper foot and bandaging it with the guava leaf. Well done, Tio Santo chuckled. Don't stop now, you have eight more toes down there. What if I tickled her? Benjo asked, still hanging on to the cat's neck. I don't need special effects, Lolo Denoy sniffed, warming up to the task. I can handle witches with fetishes well enough alone. Another spasm rocked the cat and three middle toes fell out of its mouth. Lolo Denoy was beginning to enjoy himself. Why so quiet, Nai Ising, he wheedled. What's the matter? Cat got your tongue? The cat yowled and threw up three more middle toes. Only two little ones left, the Arbolario declared. That calls for a really good joke, Lolo, Lolo Denoy mused. Benjo. Remember that leper who used to come to town? Benjo nodded eagerly. Every time he paid for lunch, a bit of his finger would drop off. What did he tell the waiter then? Keep the tip, Benjo giggled. They laughed so hard, they almost missed catching the last two toes. Suddenly the cat began to swell. In seconds, Benjo found himself holding Nai Ising. Let me go, she screeched. Not just yet, Lolo Denoy chuckled. We don't often have such charming guests. Let us entertain you. Shall we start with your toes? Teo Santo took a dried stingray tail from his basket and began tickling the witch's feet. The neighborhood echoed with her shrieks. No one knew what made her scream louder, the tickling or Lolo Denoy's jokes. Nai Ising limped home in the morning, cursing everyone she met. 
That night, she took a boat to Romblon and never returned to that town again. Oh, yay, thank you, Thelma. Thank you. That was so awesome, Thelma. Thank you. I hope it wasn't too punny. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you. Oh my God, awesome. it was so good. I can see Yay. it at the children's theater play. It was so cute. Thank, Thank you. you. And in uh, Philippine Fright, uh, yeah, some of the stories are like this, where like I feel like it's it's good to tell little kids, and then some of them. I even felt like like oh you could you could be an older adult too with like uh the Mananango or no Aswang story. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That was so lovely. I've never heard it read to me. Oh, wonderful! You're very welcome. Um. Oh, so, and, uh, Maria, did you uh -huh. uh, want to talk about like um Thelma's uh plays that are showing up? Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Marivy. Um, I wanted to let everybody know that um, right now uh, at the Southwestern College Theater, um, you can see Kasama, which are two one-act plays. Um, one is um, Hand Under Hand, and then the other one is The Fire in Me. And um, yeah. I've also staged these plays at the Central Library, and they're both really like amazing and really heartfelt um, plays about uh, one is about uh, domestic violence and um, the other one is about uh, like being a caregiver. And yes, and I noticed something on the slide. It's actually recommended for ages 15 and up because of the adult subject matter. Mm. But I hope people will get a chance to see it. Thanks so much for sharing Azalea. Oh, thank you. And uh, for more information, you can check out uh, the Southwest or swctheater.com website. Thank you. And uh, next we'll have Mari V reading um, Spooky Mo, which is also a pun if you did not know. I know, like <laughs> naughty. I came up with a pun before I actually wrote the collection. And um, my late publisher at the time, I was like, okay, I will do this, the, the grown up version of Philippine Fried. But, I wanted to be called Spooky Mo because when I was um, when I was younger in college, uh, a friend of mine, he, his, he was a lovely man and he would yell at me across the court, uh, across UP's lobby and say, Spooky Mo, which is really your vagina. And uh, <laughs> so I had a lot of fun when I came to visit after the book was launched, going to National Bookstore and asking the sales girls, Nasan bang Spooky Mo? which is where is your vagina? But anyway, uh, <laughs> having said that, uh, this story is called Talunang Manok. And for people who don't know how, um, know much about Philippine uh, culture or cuisine, uh, there is a dish called Talunang Manok, which is like, um, you know, a, a cockfight, the losing cock gets cooked. And um, just as to add context to this story, because I'm reading just an excerpt, uh, the woman in this story, Sokoro, she's just discovered or she's known for a while that her husband has been cheating on her. And the night that he runs off to see his mistress that she has just discovered, he dies in a fatal car accident. So this is where I take off. Shortly after midnight, the, the driver's widow was shown into the morgue. She stood at the head of the table on which the corpse lay hidden beneath a clean white sheet. The female doctor on duty raised the sheet long enough for Sokoro to confirm that the deceased was in fact her husband, Amado. She closed her eyes briefly and nodded, letting out a slow breath. Mrs. Pelaez, I'm so sorry for your loss, Dr. Benedicto murmured. You know, his injuries would have been less severe if he had just strapped on his seatbelt. No seatbelt? I'm not surprised. Sokoro shook her head. He drives that Jaguar like a crazy teenager. The day he made partner at the law firm, he went and ordered the latest model, liquid silver. 
that's the fancy name the dealership gave the color of his Jaguar. It's his favorite toy. I mean, his, I mean, it was his favorite toy. Oh, I'm sorry. I keep talking as though he's still alive. Socorro absentmindedly patted her husband's head. Dr. Benedicto jumped at the chance to chat. It was usually so quiet down at the morgue. Mrs. Pilaes, you may not remember me, but my name is Chona, Bea Santuico's niece. You catered at my despedida de soltera last year. Socorro remember the November dinner, silverware and leaded crystal goblets gleaming beneath the fairy lights that garlanded the estate acacia trees. Ah, yes. We met at the debut of your Tita Bea's daughter. I remember now, Iha. You and your fiancé, they made such a beautiful couple. Socorro's smile faded as she looked at the shrouded corpse of her husband. Strange how life changes, no? Last year, I, I helped celebrate your wedding. And now here you are showing me my dead husband. I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have mentioned your my wedding, Dr. Benedicto Flush. Please, if there's anything I can do to help. The seed of an idea sprouted in Socorro's mind. Walking halfway down the table, she lifted the sheet. While most of her husband was barely recognizable, his private parts were in pristine condition. She turned to the young doctor and framed her request as delicately as possible. You know... Amado wanted to be cremated. Pero hija, I love my husband at, me, at least as much as you love yours. And the thought of every last bit of him going up in smoke. So I got to wipe away an insincere tear. It's just too much to bear. Dr. Benedicto stepped towards Socorro, ready with her stock phrases of sympathy, but the widow, widow continued to speak. We were not blessed with children. And after the funeral, I will have nothing to remind me of him. I know this is highly irregular, but please, Iha, could you give me this one small piece of my husband to take home? It's the only part of him that looks whole. Socorro raised the sheet and pointed at Amado's limp penis. I just want to bury it in the garden under his favorite mango tree. Startled, the doctor drew back, but Socorro pressed on, lowering her voice as though afraid that the neighboring dead would overhear. Please, Jonah, could you do this for your tita Socorro? We're all alone here and no one needs to know. The morticians are coming in the morning and I will explain the missing portion to them. I promise you won't get into trouble. Socorro grabbed the doctor's hand. Please, a tiny souvenir is all I need. All right, Tita. I would never do this for anyone else, but for you. Chana extricated her hand from Socorro's brushing grip. Let me find a scalpel. So after the ninth day of prayer, Socorro was done mourning her faithless husband, and she returned to cooking with a vengeance. The day after his cremation, Amado Pelaez's ashes filled a heavy silver urn that claimed the place of honor atop the dining room credenza. The balance of his remains sat on the butcher's block, waiting to enrich the special dish Socorro was cooking for her one dinner guest. Socorro sliced the shaft and scrotum into anonymous cubes and stirred them into a stew of chicken thighs, pig's feet, and black beans. The pot muttered ominously, exhaling breaths heavy with garlic and anise. Socorro summoned Cassandra to this intimate dinner by enlisting the age aid of the other lawyers' wives who nagged until their husbands all but commanded the junior Filipino-American associate to attend a despedida dinner before she left Manila and returned to New York. So it was that barely two weeks after the tragic accident, the two women, the widow and the mistress, sat across from each other, Amado's ash ashes perched just beyond the cabicero. You really shouldn't have gone to all this trouble, Cassandra began as Socorro ladled the generous portion of stew onto her guest's plate. No trouble at all, hija. Cooking is my therapy. Amado always spoke so well of you and your... Socorro handed Cassandra her plate. Your work. 
he would have wanted to send you off with a little despedida. Please try this. This was one of my husband's favorite dishes. So for a watch mesmerized as Cassandra speared a cube of flesh and slid the fork into her mouth, chewing with obvious relish. No wonder a model like this. It's so tender and hmm, you don't know, savory, kind of musky way. You really are an amazing cook. She saluted Socorro with her wine glass and took a sip. Socorro drank with her. You know, I was just wondering, when was the last time you saw my husband? Cassandra swirled the glass in her the wine in her glass, as though suddenly fascinated by its blood red hue. Well, that would have been Friday afternoon at the office. You didn't have to work overtime that weekend. Amado spent so many times, so many weekends at work. Lord, no. It was raining so hard that Sunday, I refused to leave my condo. We ordered Chinese takeout for dinner. We, Sakura raised an eyebrow. Cassandra speared another chunk of meat with her fork. I had a visitor. Anyone I know? Sokoro was smiling, but her eyes were cold. Cassandra's fork paused midway to her mouth. Sorry, but um, I'd rather not talk about it. it. It ended badly. She slipped the fork into her mouth and chewed vigorously. Sokoro picked at her mango salad and watched the younger woman finish her dinner. Bite, chew, swallow. Bite, chew, swallow. They ate in awkward silence until, with a discreet burp, Cassandra made a feeble attempt at chit chat. So, is this a Filipino dish? It doesn't taste anything like adobo. Actually, it's a similar stew called talunang manok. Socorro dabbed at her mouth with a napkin. The local tradition among cockfighters is when a roaster is killed in a cockfight, he isn't just thrown away. The sabungero takes him home and cooks him for dinner. You know, we Filipinos, we hate to see anything go to waste. Socorro folded her napkin, carefully smoothing the wrinkles around Amado's monogrammed initials. In other words, Cassandra, what you are eating is defeated cock. He lost, you see. Cassandra looked confused. I, I could have sworn I was eating pork just now. Socorro gazed at her dead husband's lover with unexpected pity. You're right, of course. He really was a pig. Thank you. And I have the recipe if you need it um, for the actual Taluna Mono. I love how you ended that. Thank you, Mari V. <laughs> Omari V also um, graciously donated the San Diego Public Library a copy of Spooky Mo. So now um, everyone can also place it on hold. Um, yeah. She has so much range in Spooky Mo. Like some of the stories are really scary and some of them are like this too, where I just love your sense of humor. And also you help make my skin crawl too. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. It's going to be actually. I, I need to say that the, the that whole collection is being recorded now as an audiobook. So um, sometime in mid November, you should be able to download all thirteen stories. I think there are. So I'll I'll let you know if anyone wants to find out more about it. Please email Azalea or me, and hopefully I can send a copy to the library as well. Thank you, Mary V. Thank you. Thank you for putting it together, Azalea. Oh, thank you. Uh, so um, I guess I don't want to go over for everyone's evening, um, but uh, just in case if anyone wanted to ask um, our two writers any questions, um, you're well than, more than welcome to type in the chat and um, I could read it out loud. I guess uh, just in case, while we wait, I'll ask one question. Um, so uh, Mari V and Thelma, um, <clears throat> like in both your works, um, something that we were talking about when we first met, um, uh, maybe a month or two ago, um, I guess I was thinking like both of your works address like issues that are scarier than ghosts, <laughs> such as, you know, domestic violence <laughs> and dementia. And, uh, you know, we're also living through a pandemic. Um, I was wondering like, just uh, like, why do you think that we enjoy pursuing fear and being afraid when real life is already so scary? <laughs> 
I'm going to cheat and answer this by saying I read a New York Times essay recently that posed the same question. And in the essay, it said, we pursue scary stories in order to process our own fears. And the good part about the stories is that they end. Like, hopefully the pandemic yes. will end. But in stories, there's a little more control because even if it doesn't end well, at least the story ends. Yeah. I have to agree with Thelma because um, the pandemic itself, it, it's so nebulous. You don't know who's gonna, well, you kind of know who's gonna die, the unvaccinated stupid people. But um, really uh, it's kind of like a moving target. Whereas if you have like a defined, you know, monster, whether it's an Aswang or a Mananangal or Freddy Krueger, you know, or the Texas chain, the, the leather face guy, the Texas chainsaw massacre or any of the villains in like, um, Law and Order, which I was addicted to for many, many years, um, you know that at the end of the hour, the bad guy will be caught, justice will be served. And um, so people, I think, in the same way that they get on like a, a, a roller coaster, they want to get the, the thrill of the scare, they want to be frightened, but they also know that they also want to know that at the end of a specific time, their fears will be gone, everything will be resolved life will be go on as possible and I think that's why people cleave towards like scary stories because it's an identifiable threat and that threat is vanquished at the end of the story. Oh thank you both for answering that question and um, I see we have one great question from the audience. Thank you Mark um, and I'd like to ask this before uh, we transition to the, the ghost storytelling. Um, what are you what are you both working on at the moment? Velma, you should start. Well, I have a few things in my head, but one thing that I wrote a little bit about today is an exploration of some scary stories from my family history. And I was part of a meeting today with Sarah Greenman, part of the Creative Alchemy Cycle, and she suggested connecting with nature. So I was actually able to inject some natural elements in my story to make it come more alive. So in a way, family stories can be scary. The human uh, level can be scary. But when you connect it to some natural elements that can kind of give us some comfort and strength looking at a bigger picture. Yeah, and I'm, I'm still working on that historical novel that no one seems to want, but um, hopefully, you know, the ninth year is the charm. <laughs> so, so yeah, like I, I've just come to realize that you know, writing is a, it's, it's just, you have to be in it for the long haul. And especially when it comes to novels, you have to, you have to accept that it's, it's just going to be a very long stretch. It's like a marathon. It's not a sprint. So, yeah. What is your novel about, Marie V? Oh, it's about San Diego and in the 1930s in the gas lamp district. And I think at, um, maybe now, as opposed to three years ago, people are more ready to um, read historical things. I don't know. Like um, I kind of, cause I've talked so much about it over the years that I really don't want to get into it. Um, it's a little boring for people who've heard about it <laughs> over the years. Uh, what was really cool is Mari V wrote a scene from it and put it into an Asian story theater production called Hollow Hollow. And so that we got- That stage, yeah, yeah. It was awesome. So that was not boring at all. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was. Thank you for putting that on. Oh, thank you. I guess now we shall segue into our campfire tales. Yeah. Um, and uh, so these are supposed to be uh, tales that that have happened to us and uh, um, all tell tell and um, my coworker Albert 
and uh, Mari V's friend uh, Jojo will also tell tales. Let's see. <laughs> okay. So um, the story is called A Capre. <laughs> Um, mom hated staying alone in my grandparents' wooden house. When my mom was a little girl in the Philippines, she harvested tobacco with her family in Santo Tomas, a beautiful countryside with sprawling green tobacco fields surrounded by mountains. Her family lived in a nipa hut during the warmer season and a wood and concrete house during the cooler seasons. Lolo and Lola lived in a two-story white wood house with an outdoor bathroom and kitchen. Um, a tall mango tree was planted in their backyard, which was filled with orchids, chickens, and goats. Every day, um, Lolo, who was blinded by glaucoma, would sit about listening to the radio, and Lola, the more active of the two, puttered about the first floor, staying close to Lolo. My Atta and I got a chance to stay with them for one week back in 2014. Um, for fun, um, my sister and I would hang out with our cousin Egan, who lived with them, and we made day trips into town so we could eat Jollibee and Chow King since my grandparents were primarily vegetarians. At the end of each sweaty day, we bathed in cold water with a tabo, went upstairs to our room, put on fresh house clothes, and put away the dirty clothes in plastic bags inside our suitcase. After that, we'd turn off the light in the hallway and lie awake talking for hours until we lost consciousness. Lolo and Lola went to bed much earlier in a bed located um, with the first, on the first floor with their um, kutulong or servant, um, while they, they slept on a small bed near the stairs. Um, Egan slept in a room across the hallway from ours on the second floor. During our last night in Ilocos, our cousin Egan went to visit his girlfriend in Baguio and the whole second floor was ours. Me and my sister decided it was time to sleep. So I went into the hallway um, to turn off the light and walk back. Um, when I came back, my sister had already turned her back to me and she was asleep. I laid down right next to her and stared into the dark alone. Except I wasn't alone. While my sister slept, plastic bags crinkled loudly near my head and our suitcases shook along the length of the bed. I pulled the covers over my head and pressed myself against my sister's back so that she was pressed against the wall. All night long, it sounded like someone was deliberately squeezing the plastic bags inches away from my head, shaking our luggage and throwing our clothes across the room. I thought I was going to die. Eventually, I fell asleep exhausted. In the golden morning, I saw that all our luggage, plastic bags, and clothes were all where they should be. That day, my sister and I boarded the bus back to Metro Manila, and we finally left Santo Tomas. Or when we finally left Santo Tomas, I told my sister what happened. She said that right before I went to turn off the lights, she saw an iridescent cloud in front of the dresser, and she decided she wasn't going to acknowledge it. After my auntie Arsenia collected us at the terminal and we headed out for dinner, I told my cousin Sarah Jane and Jordana what happened to me and they burst out laughing. My cousin Sarah Jane told me that you can always hear footsteps going up and down the stairs at that house. Years later, when I asked my mom about it again, she told me she would often hear footsteps and noises in the kitchen, which scared her even when she stayed close to my Lola. My Lola couldn't hear any of this while it was going on. Growing up, my sister's siblings often saw disappearing shadows in the windows. Even today, while my, my mom might insist that ghosts don't exist, she also told me she suspects it was a tree spirit that belonged to a mango tree that no longer stands. When I sent a Facebook message to my aunt, she basically told me, you think your grandpa's house is haunted? Your great grandfather's house was way more haunted. <laughs> my aunt says um, spirits are everywhere wandering. And um, so that really <laughs> happened to me. <laughs> Great story. <laughs> I'm not, yeah. Anyhow, th thanks, Albert. <laughs> okay, and next up is my colleague, Albert Elgira. Let me turn on my video. I'm not sure you could see me. I'm in the dark. I'm in my, my uh, son's bedroom, which is a mess. So I'm trying to. Keep it dark in here. Um, hang on. Okay. Let's see here. Let 
Am I visible now a little bit? Yes. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. I don't have a script. I'm just, you know, I'm going to recount something that happened to me when I was probably 11 or 12 years old. And um, we lived in Manila, which is the capital city of the Philippines. And, um, and to travel to um, my mom's um, hometown, which is in the central Philippines uh, called the Visayas, we had to take either an airplane, which is very rare at the time, uh, plus there was no airport that was close by, so we had to take a boat. And uh, the trip was like almost a day and a half by this, you know, really old um, cruise liner uh, that they used to, you know, uh, that people used to um, take you know, when, when, when going around different islands. Um, so it was a long, long trip. People were really tired. I was really tired. I was like, you know, 11 and 12. And I threw up a couple of times because it was my first time on a boat, uh, on a big ship. And so when we got to this um, place where we had to take another boat to get to my mom's hometown, um we were really tired and so we took the first boat that we could because that was you know what was available at the time and my mom said well we really have to you know get home because your sister i was we were my sister was with us too and she was maybe eight years old at that time so she was really tired um so this is around midnight when we got to um the port to catch the boat to get you know to take us to my mom's uh, little island and so everybody was tired there were probably um about 20 people on that boat including us and i was tired but i was awake and um the um what do you call this the this little motorboat that we took uh, could only hold like maybe 20, 25 people. And it was the only one awake and I was awake. Maybe some other people were awake. And it was like an hour of boat ride from that port all the way to my mom's still town. And so midway um, in the middle of, you know, it was dark, you know, you could see the sun. I mean, the, the moon it was around midnight and the water was calm there was you know no waves whatsoever and i was just looking maybe you know to the left of the boat and then i would know i i noticed that there was this light this flickering light and i thought it was you know because at that time around that time my mom would tell me that all the people would usually go on their little bancas or this little you know mini boats that they would um do um you know fishing uh during the night and and so that's what i was thinking that this little light was just you know light from the lamp of this fisherman who would just you know just go on and 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 and, and trying to catch his fish and I still was looking at the light and all of a sudden this light started rolling. And I was like, what the heck, you know, is it's a rolling light. And I didn't pay too much attention to it. And then just kept on rolling and then rolling back and forth. And then it was like going around, floating. And then all of a sudden it just stopped. And then for a minute, I said, okay, they probably caught something. And then it started rolling again. And then that's when I said, hey, hey, look, look. I told, you know, I told my mom, try to wake up my mom. And some of the people like, you know, what are you looking at? What are you pointing at? So I was pointing at this light. Uh, and then the old people who were on the boat said, hey, little boy, stop what you're doing. Don't point. And two minutes later, that calm water 
turned into like waves. Our, our boat was being slammed left and right by these waves. And all the people were like, you know, what's happening? And some of the old people started praying and, and saying their incantations. And five minutes later, the water turned calm. And they like castigated me. Don't do that again. You know, that's a Santelmo. And you're not supposed to be pointing at it. And so I was like, you know, I was a little boy and I was like, oh, I, 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 I'm really sorry. And then, and then I got scared. And then when we got home, my grandma, um, you know, told me a story where um, my grandpa, which my mom's dad, um, you know, he was a fisherman and he had encountered a lot of the Santelmos and uh, when he would see them and they would approach him, all he did was to um, inhale or, or um, how do you, what do you call it? You know, cause a cigarette, you know, uh, a smoker, he would just inhale uh, on the cigarette and, and, and the Santelmo would just disappear. So it's some, some sort of like a malevolent uh, spirit or, or being that, you know, has tried to, um, uh, what they're saying is um, cause harm or, or try to, if you're looking for a direction, you know, and, and, and then point you into a different direction. And then that, that will cause you to, you know, to um, either fall into, you know, bad luck or something like that. So um, that's about it. It's, you know, it was, it was a scary time for me because you know I was a little kid I didn't know what it was and and reading more about it it's you know I, I was into understanding that it it's some form of you know of a spirit that you know um that is either evil or or um I don't know something that can't be explained um so I don't know. <laughs> I'm I'm so unprepared, but that's that's my story. So. Oh, thank you, Albert. I love that you included some more details I hadn't heard before. Um, I was going to go share some some screenshots, but um, yeah, it, it's too late now. Um, I'm also um, I have another one. Uh, if you guys give me more time. Um, this is about my brother. My brother passed away in August uh, of this year uh, because of COVID and um, he was in the Philippines. Unfortunately, we couldn't go because, you know, there was lockdown and uh, all those things. You have to quarantine. And um, so back in the eighties, um, he was an engineer way back uh, way back when and he spent a lot of time in the middle east and um coming home you know we usually uh do a lot of things uh with my dad um then my dad passed away and he couldn't come on time because he was busy or you know his schedule didn't, didn't allow it and so when my father passed away um, like three days later, um, after he was buried, my, my brother came home and of course he was so distraught that, you know, he was, he wasn't there for the funeral, things like that. And so one night, uh, he told us that you know, our house in, in Manila was like a two-story house and, um, came down around one o'clock in the morning and um, coming down the stairs, you know, it was a little dark in the kitchen. The kitchen is maybe, you know, a few feet away from the stairs. And um, he noticed that there was a little flicker of light. Uh, I guess it was one of those night light, you know, that you 
um, leave, you know, we turn off the lights. And he noticed that there was somebody sitting at the dining table. And it was only like the profile of a guy, of a person um, drinking coffee. And so as he was approaching, he noticed that the profile matched my dad's. And he was like, Dad, is, is that you? And then when he turned up the light, and the image was gone. So um, the interpretation was, you know, it was my dad's way of saying, hey, you know, we, I missed you at, at the funeral. But now that you're here, you know, I'm, I'm happy. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, A.E. Okay. You have to yourself, Jojo. Oh, and next, uh, we have uh, Jojo uh, Rontu Ramirez. Hey, my name is Jojo. Uh, he did pronouns. I'm uh, actually, I identify as Katukubo. I'm an indigenous person from the Philippines. Uh, my father is Ilocano and Igorot from the Tuwali people of the Ifugao tribe. My mother is Sambal, Sambal Ita from the Aita community and also Moro from the Iranun community, uh, particularly the Laya people. And so um, this story actually is my pre-coming to birth story, uh, coming to my early childhood story. So uh, my mom lives in Dirita, which is, I guess you can say, like a hillside village in the Sambalas region from her Sambal side. So that's where I was born. Um, so when I was still in her stomach, uh, she was pregnant. She lived beside, uh, I guess in, in Tagalog, you would say Mangkukulam, um, um, but we call it Mananimbrot, uh, which is like in our community, our tribe, uh, it's like a witch doctor or someone who's witch, but it's all usually in the uh, negative. Um, and so, do what she was a neighbor and she would always say that she would put curses on our family or we call it humpa. Uh, the humpa is like ways that like we would uh, take someone's uh, family possession and spit at it or uh, say something evil or say their names out loud and like uh, they would, we would get a fever or you would get sick um, and this we call it humpa. And so while she was walking home and uh, when she was pregnant, she saw a dead dog's body uh, near the rice field. And she got really scared. And she so she would say, uh, in, in Tagalog, you'd say, tabi, tabi po. And for us, we'd say, bari, bari, apu. And so she said, bari, bari, apu. And she said it multiple times before she went to her house, uh, to her little hut, uh, to, her, to my family's like area. And then she saw the exact same dog uh, as a ghost in front of her house. And she was, and the dog was barking at her. And so she asked the dog to not, you know, not harm her, but instead protect me as a child. Uh, that she was pregnant. And then there's, you know, that um, hopefully this dog, uh, we call it Ahu. Um, I saw in Tagalog, but we call it Ahu. Um, and Ahu would be there as like my guardian animal or my guardian uh, entity that would protect me from any um, negative harm or uh, particularly from the Manadin blood next door. So while she was giving birth to me, um, they, heard, they said that, my mom told me that she would hear like laughter and the laughter was from the neighbor, uh, the witch, right? Or the, the, the witch doctor. And so the person who was giving, uh, like, like the person who was helping give birth to me um, took a string, um, scissors and for us it's called the pikanaon uh, or pikanaon uh, which is like a ceremonial cutting of the string and so they the person cut the string and all you heard was the 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 man in blood next door scream and she was right and my mom said that neighbors saw her come, uh, rushing out of her house with her tongue bleeding and so uh the the pikanaon uh ceremonially cut her tongue before she would even uh um, on me uh, and so when I was born, my mom was very, you know, was uh, very scared because there was a lot of like, uh, like potentially witchcraft or magic that would like harm me. So she took a, a tuko, which is uh, a butike or a, a gecko or lizard, and she took it from the wall and they told her that she, to take the lizard or uh, the tuko and let it 
bite me on the left nipple as a child. And so now like that was supposed to be my way of like preventing uh, any harm to come to me. And since I was a kid, uh, we would go to the beach a couple times a month um, and uh, they would make a ditch for me and put, uh, we call it lobong lobong, which is the jellyfish and put it upside down. And as a child, uh, they would let me like swim and get stung by the jellyfish uh, to protect me from any evil spirit because uh, the because I was born right beside an amanin blood and there was already harm coming to me. And so even up to right now as a, mid thirties individual, uh, even going through surgery because of all like the jellyfish thing that I endured uh, as a child, I have a hard time um, with anesthesia. So anything from like with my crown for my teeth, when I had surgery, I can feel everything. Um, I don't have a lot of uh, uh, reception to those, to anesthesia or even sleeping uh, gas when I go to surgery. So I've always joked around with my mom about like what would have happened if the Namanin in blood actually succeeded. And she said that I would have probably probably be a stillborn. Um, and that there was they were lucky to have a, a local shaman to help me be, you know, to prevent me from that. But more so because of the aho that was protecting me, because even up to right now, sometimes I feel like there's a dog in me. My dogs at my house would bark randomly beside me or sometimes get really scared when they're coming near me because they, my mom said that it's because the aho is still beside, uh, like, you know, protecting me from everything. And there's moments when I hear randomly uh, dog bark or anything happens, like if there's a potential accident, like I was about to drive, I was driving and I got almost got into an accident and I heard a dog bark and I slammed on the brakes and that prevented me from, uh, from, like smashing into a car so uh in my tribe like a lot of the like the local animals and spirits are the ones that protect us and and uh and we still have money in blood uh the the lot beside my mom's house is still there they put like um they burn figs and tree branches in front of it uh to prevent the like the spirits from coming particularly the dead which is spirits from haunting anybody so usually they make atong or atang uh which is food and uh, alcohol offerings to make sure that it's still uh, appeased by the spirits oh, wow thank you jojo for sharing your story it's like an origin story too. That's a great story, Joseph. And I have to say that um, I'm, my day job is as a phone interpreter. And I remember one memorable call where um, this old lady in the United States was talking about how she was bewitched by a mangkukulam. And um, she thought her life her uh, was at risk. Um, obviously, she was talking to a therapist, but um, she was convinced that she was going to die. So, moves from the old country to here. That never leaves you. <laughs> um, uh, just I think you're muted, Azalea. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, just since, thank you. <laughs> just since we're past eight, I want to be respectful of everybody's time, um, and I want to thank everybody for um, their time attending Philippine Fright Night. And I wanted to thank Mari V and Thelma and Albert and Jojo for sharing their stories. Maraming um, salamat po. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for putting it together. Oh, absolutely. And um, if anyone would like more information about our writers, um, please visit uh, Mari V and Thelma's websites. And thank you, everybody. Shall we publish the poll results? Oh, in yeah. The poll? oh yeah. Let's see. It looks like the winner. Oh yeah, the Aswala. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you didn't ask about the white lady. Yeah, that's a really big deal, the white lady in the Philippines. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, we should do it again next year, like Mark Cherry said. Agree. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for putting oh. it together, Azalea.
Thank oh, you. Thank, so thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mari Vian Thelma and Jojo and Albert. Yeah. Happy Filipino American History Month, everybody. Yeah. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Take it easy. Bye. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Take care. Have a good night, Thanks, everybody. Albert. Thank Bye, you. Bye, Thelma. See you tomorrow.